Hi there, I'm Andrea Koppel, and it's time for Coffee, the podcast where you get to hear firsthand what the jobs and careers that interest you the most are really like. Hey there, Java junkies. Welcome to another episode of t for c If you're interested in the operational side of running television, cable, and digital on-demand entertainment programming, then this is the episode for you. Because my next guest is the General Manager of Content Acquisitions and Operations at the Discovery Corporation, which includes 18 different brands, among them HDTV, the Food Network, the Travel Channel, and on and on. But before I introduce you to Jonathan Sickle, I want to make sure you've signed up for the Java Junkies Journal. That's time for Coffee's weekly newsletter that comes out on Mondays and gives you a sneak peek at the episodes and the professionals we're going to be featuring that week. And I assure you, it is super easy and fast to do. Just go to the Time for Coffee website at time, the number four coffee.org and the sign up box is right there. Now, my Java lovers, please grab your mug and take a chug because it's time for another caffeinated career conversation. And my guest is Jonathan Sickle, the general manager of content acquisitions and operations at Discovery. Jonathan began working at Discovery Communications way back in 2004 as Vice President of Business Affairs, in which he was responsible for overseeing programming deals across Discovery's domestic and international cable networks. Prior to working at Discovery, Jonathan worked at America Online as Vice President of Programming Business Development. And Jonathan has had a number of other jobs which we'll get into in the meantime for Coffee Interview. Check out show notes to see if that episode has already dropped. Jonathan is a lawyer who graduated cum laude from Harvard Law School and spent two years working at the law firm Skadden Arps in Los Angeles before he caught the entertainment bug. And that's when he moved over to the e-television networks as a director and eventually as Vice President of Business and Legal Affairs. Jonathan, welcome to Time for Coffee. Are you caffeinated and ready to go? Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. I am caffeinated and ready to go and so honored to be here with you. Oh, I am so thrilled to have the opportunity to dig into how we can help young people break into this really dynamic industry that you're in, Jonathan. And the first espresso shot is, what are the entry-level jobs that are available to young people who want to break into this industry? Well, I'm looking forward to the espresso shots today, and I'll give you some points from my career, which is just one perspective, and I appreciate the background. There's a lot of details in between, but hopefully we can touch on some of the more salient points today. Entry-level jobs can be across the board if you're interested in programming and production, starting out as an executive assistant or as a production assistant. Just getting your feet wet in the media business, in television or digital content. Television is a slowly melting business, but still thriving. Just looking around, learning whether you want to go into the business side of production, for example, starting out as a business affairs assistant or coordinator who is helping gather information to help figure out what kinds of deals we do. That's a lot of what my team and I do on a day-to-day basis, which is work with producers and work with talent to put shows and content together on a day-to-day basis. So there are so many areas. And what I will say from my experience is that what you start out with doesn't mean that's where you're going to end up. Oh my God, a hundred percent. I am so glad you made that point. Yes, it is. I'll tell you, I studied in college urban planning, architecture, design, never thinking I would be doing this in my uh, in my career. But as it turns out, 
my various networking opportunities, my situations, locations where I was at the time in Los Angeles led me to where I am today. So whatever you plan on doing may not come true, but new opportunities and paths, I believe, will will come across that you never expected. Absolutely. I could not agree anymore, Jonathan. So what is a useful skill or skills that you look for in the young people that you hire at Discovery? I believe in mindset over skill set. What I mean by that is, sure, if you have relevant experience in production or deal making or negotiations, that's helpful. But having the right spirit, having the right attitude, work ethic, and team collaboration is so important to me. Somebody who's eager and willing, willing to make mistakes, willing to acknowledge them, willing to say, what else can I do to help? That spirit to me is, I think in any industry, so critical to success. And that's what I look for. I look for somebody who can laugh. I mean, humor to me is such a critical value and not taking ourselves too seriously. As I say often, we're not changing kidneys in the content business. We are, you know, we're, we're delighting and entertaining and, and that takes time. It takes patience. It takes creativity and it takes mistakes. And being able to kind of conquer all those elements, I think, is, is what keeps you going. I think it is so wonderful that someone at your level, Jonathan, is modeling that and mentoring your team with Mm. that kind of esprit de corps to say, you're going to make mistakes. Just own it and let's move on. Those are such important lessons. What about life experiences, Jonathan? So things outside the classroom, what in your experience, do you think are the most useful ones for someone to have who's starting out in this field? I think there's such a breadth of life experience that you can have, whether you worked at a donut shop or when I was in high school, I worked on an assembly line at the company where my father worked. They're not necessarily directly associated skills, but they teach you patience. They teach you the need for detail. They teach you the need for communication. I believe that you can take skills and directly apply them, whatever businesses you've been in before, and use them to your advantage. You know, if you were a barista, for example, you have to know how to listen, how to ask questions, and you can use those skills when you're in a meeting. One of the values or characteristics that I really applaud in, in team members is having a voice. I believe some people are extroverts, some people are introverts, but being able to sit at a table and say, I don't agree, or that doesn't make sense to me. In some cases, it requires you to find energy or find a spirit, especially if you're an introvert. It's hard sometimes to bring those questions up. But if you can, if you can break through whatever your background is, if your experiences allow you to say, hey, that doesn't make sense to me, let's try it a different way, is another example of how you will you'll just do great. Whatever path you take in the media industry that I'm in, whether it's production, whether it's business, whether it's legal, whether it's human resources. Fantastic. So what about someone's major, Jonathan? Is it a deciding factor to get into this profession? In other words, if they haven't studied fill in the blank, is that a deal breaker? And I'm asking this question, I know, to someone whose major (laughs) was public and international affairs at the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton. Yeah, that's true. I do not believe it at all. I mean, having communication background, having a business background, that's terrific. And that brings essential skills. But personally, I do not think having a specific major is critical to determining what you're going to be doing later on. Like you mentioned, I studied public and international affairs with architecture and geography, really very little relevance to how to make a cake on Food Network. (laughs) 
or or how to delight people with stories of traveling on the Travel Channel. But again, when looking at the broader picture, I worked in teams. I worked with people both in college and law school. I spent a year teaching in Singapore, culturally different perspectives, different points of view, whether it's creative, political, economic, being able to interact with people of all different backgrounds and experiences allows you to step back and say, maybe my take or view on the world isn't the right one for this experience. I'll tell you an example. People often come to me and say, I have a great idea for a food show. I have a great idea for a travel show or for an HGTV home design show. And my first reaction is, you may not be the audience for these ideas. What you need to understand is who is our audience? What are they looking for? An example is on Travel Channel, people will come to me and say, I have a great idea for the most out-of-the-way spots in Paris for a show. And I'll say to them, well, how many of our viewers actually are interested in out-of-the-way places in Paris? It's a fascinating topic, and it may be a fascinating topic to us, but not to the broad audience that we're getting at. So really being able to separate your personal views from those of your audience, those of your customers, those of your people that you're trying to, to communicate with are important. And whatever your major was in college, whatever you studied, Taking the best of those experiences and interactions will help with that mindset that I'm looking for when I'm hiring. Wonderful. What about a graduate school degree? And this is less so for the entry-level positions and more so for those who want to get into the C-suite the way that you are now. And if so, Jonathan, what are the most useful grad school degrees that they should think about getting? I have a law degree, as you said, from Harvard and had a, a wonderful, learned a lot, was in a, a large law school, one of the larger law schools in the U.S. with many different backgrounds. So I say the benefit that I got, not only from sort of studying hard, actually being forced to study hard, was to be able to debate, was to be able to kind of have a constructive, critical conversation. So from a law degree perspective, there's the practical side. So, you know, if you want to go into law contracts, that's obvious. Having a business degree, if you're going to go into business development or modeling, learning how to use a spreadsheet, those are very practical skills that having a graduate degree calls for. I was an adjunct professor lecturer at American University in Washington, D.C., teaching the business and legal affairs side of production to master's degree candidates in the School of Journalism and Production. And what I found most helpful was if you're representing yourself, if you want to be a producer, what are some of the practical skills that I need to know? And whether you go for a graduate degree or not, learning some of those skills that you can get in a, in a graduate degree. So again, getting your master's in journalism or in production at a school around the country is helpful because it gives you some of the skills to be able to negotiate for yourself. If you're an independent producer, you need to make sure that you know how to clear rights. What do you do with music? You can't just take music and put it in a video. So there are degrees, business, production, where you will learn specific skills. That said, again, I still go back to my mantra of mindset over skill set. You don't have to have a graduate degree to get into the C-suite. You don't have to have a, a law degree to make it to the top levels of an organization. You do need a law degree if you want to practice law, of course, and a bar exam in, in your background as well. But again, it can help. It can help with your critical thinking, but not absolutely necessary. Terrific. What, Jonathan, is the best part for you of being in this line of work? That's a great question and something I have to ask myself every day because some days it's wonderful, some days it's a slog. I'm in a business that, that delight and entertains and informs at Discovery. We have, as you said, over 18 brands, Discovery Channel, Animal Planet, Food Network, HGTV, Travel Channel, TLC, Investigation Discovery. 
I could go on and on. We have a breadth of content and unscripted programming that will entertain anybody and everybody. And it's the passion for bringing stories to our consumers every day that sort of adds some joy to their life, I'd say, is what keeps me going. That's the best part. I would gather that if you go into most doctor offices, dentist offices around the country, more often than not, you're going to see HGTV or Food Network on the TV screen in the office. And to me, what that says is, we want to take you away. We want to help you escape from what's to come, from that dental cleaning, or from <laughs> you know that, that physical that you're going to get. And knowing that I help contribute to a sense of escape, to a sense of calm every day, to a sense of delight, whether it's you know seeing where the participant in a House Hunters International is going to end up in his or her home or what the best cake from the competition is going to look like and knowing that people really enjoy that, that keeps me coming back every day. Wonderful. So you've already alluded to this. What is the part of your current job that sucks the most? <laughs> Ah, well, you know, there's not too much, but every day, you know, I think everybody steps in a puddle. I learned a lot from some sayings that my family, my grandmother, lots of relatives have told me through the years, every day you're going to step in a puddle and get yourself or somebody else wet and you just have to get over it. What I mean by that is sometimes I'm going to write a really innocent email that offends somebody like, hey, that's my job. Or that's something that you don't need to bother yourself with or that that's already taken care of. Something done with innocence sometimes hits people the wrong way and we just have to deal with it. I don't know if it, it sucks necessarily, but you know, kind of having to move and, and manage people's expectations on a day-to-day -day basis is something that keeps me thinking. Something else is the reality of the business that I'm in. The vast majority of Discovery's revenue comes from linear television around the world. And, and I, I do mean around the world. We are in countries in every territory, every region. And the fact is that the way people are consuming content is changing in many ways a good way. But the usual way that we've been distributing through linear television where people sign up for a pay TV operator, Comcast or Time Warner or Spectrum, you name it, and then you sit back in your couch and you watch your linear stream, you watch Food Network as it goes throughout the day, is changing with the advent of subscription video on demand services like Netflix and Amazon and Apple and YouTube, you name it. It's a more on demand. It's a content availability is much more prevalent. So the competition is greater than it's ever been. You have younger generations who don't necessarily have a television who get their content in bites, in small bites, not typical 30 or 60 minute length episodes. So Having to think about the comfort that we've had over the years and having to rethink how we get consumers' attention, which is more and more distracted by technology and by massive amount of content coming our way, is it's a challenge on how we keep our business going. But it's, it's also an opportunity. It also forces us to get out of our comfort zone and think differently. So there's a lot, a lot there. Oh my gosh, back. there sure is. Now, we have three espresso shots left, and you've already alluded to some great life advice that your grandmother or grandfather <laughs> gave you about you're going to step in a puddle every day. What is the best career advice you've ever gotten, Jonathan? Well, I'll tell you one statement that I bring with me. I say it probably too often for my colleagues. They get, they get tired of me saying it, and I try to live it every day which is say something twice and then don't say it again. What I mean by that is when you say, when you give an opinion to somebody, the first time they may not have heard you, the second time they have. And they may 
choose to disregard your opinion. They may choose to take it, but not acknowledge that they're taking it. But sometimes when you beat on, for lack of a better cliche, a dead horse, when you say, this has to happen, I need this, I deserve this, I believe that virtue and and fate happens for people who are deserving. And you may be frustrated because you're not being heard. People are not getting your point. But at some point, you have to just live with it and say, I've made my point and it's now my turn to decide what I'm going to do with it. If, if my manager or my colleague refuses to listen to me, I'm either going to live with it or I'm going to take control and move on. Yes. And, and, and I, tr- I try to live by that. I don't do it all the time for sure. Sometimes I repeat myself and repeat myself, but I try when I can to say, all right, I've done all I could here. And now, now it's time to just look at the landscape and decide for myself what I can do with it. The other thing I want to say, and this is just looking back, it's not career advice, but when I was in college, a a friend and I started a group called Students on Life After Princeton Slap. It was a gem of an idea, which we didn't take fully. But, you know, when you're younger, at least in my experience, where I went to college, there were just very particular paths in life. You can be a lawyer, you could go to business school, you could go into management consulting. It was such a limited view. And I was not exposed when I was younger to all the hundreds of thousands of career turns that I could take in my life, that I could go and study in a foreign country or be a diplomat or go into production as a career. I didn't have that experience or that education in college. And I encourage everybody whenever I can to say, open your eyes and mind because there's so many things that you can do and you'll take wrong paths I did in my career. I worked for people that I way too long that I shouldn't have, but it's okay to make a change. It's okay to take a sideways turn and find what's next. Well, yet again, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And that is one of a number of reasons that I started Time for Coffee to try to open up the world, this oyster of all these different opportunities to young people who may feel like they're locked in to a particular track when in fact, they're not. Yes. Couldn't agree with you more on that point. Absolutely. Two final espresso shots. What movies, if any, or Netflix, Hulu, Amazon shows, or books, Jonathan, do you (laughs) think accurately depict your profession. And you can pick any one of the 18 brands that Discovery has as well. Well, I always think of Willy Wonka because I go into my job every day and it's like just a candy store of of opportunities. I'll meet a producer who has a great new idea for a baking show or a delightful story about a new family that we have for TLC. You know, there's that that comes to mind. Jerry Maguire or Tootsie, uh, two examples of shows where there was an agent involved. A lot of times what my job entails is is guiding our creative teams on business dealings, on how do you manage great talent? How do you build talent? How do you find production companies and, and make some good business decisions? So those are good, fun examples of movies that come to mind immediately. And, and Jerry Maguire, well, not at all related, but certainly as, an, as a sports agent as he was, you know, a lot of my job is representing the company, representing our businesses, using my creative, whatever creative strain I have in my business and legal background to make good decisions to help entertain and bring joy to our consumers. Wonderful. Well, we will include those in our show notes. Final espresso shop. What would Java junkies be surprised to learn about your profession, Jonathan? I would say the endless opportunities 
One thing I encourage team members to do is to stretch themselves and realize that the world is our oyster. Again, another cliche. I've had the opportunity to do so many different things in my career. I was the general manager of Travel Channel. I spent three years in London overseeing my former company's networks in Europe, Middle East, and Africa, Food Network, HGTV, Travel Channel, a number of other brands where I was able to bring the joy of Guy Fieri, one of our hosts on Food Network, to foreign lands like Russia and South Africa. I had the chance to be deep inside our negotiations with our most important partners, ad sales and affiliate partners, as we were negotiating carriage of our television networks to consumers at companies like Comcast and Time Warner. So there are so many options. I trained as a lawyer. I studied law, but that was only the beginning. It opened up doors to me. And because I never was satisfied to sit still, I've moved around a lot. I've said, I'm, and this is me, I'm, I'm, energized by change, by moving, by seeing the world from a different perspective. Not everybody likes that. Some people like a desk job. And I am so humbled and respectful of that. But for those who feel the need to get sort of their life force from changing, that is an opportunity for everybody. Things change whether you like it or not. And being able to adapt and to laugh and just, you know, when somebody else is screaming on the other side of the phone, I just sit back. I tune them out when I can. (laughs) Try to focus on the good points. A lot of the agents I deal with will tell you, you know, sometimes it's a rumble match. But, you know, we find we find common connection and whatever you do, finding a common connection with people. There's there's no better part of what we do on a day to day basis, whatever your career is. Well, Jonathan, I just have to say that the people who work with you at Discovery are some incredibly lucky people. I wish I had had a supervisor. Uh, I've certainly had colleagues who are as lovely as you are, but a supervisor who just has as much wisdom as you do. Thank you so much for making Time for Coffee today with me and the Time for Coffee community. And I just wish you and your family a wonderful new year. Well, thank you so much. It's great to be here. I've enjoyed our conversation and and hope uh, there's a pearl of wisdom somewhere in there. Thanks so much for listening to Time for Coffee, where the professionals in the jobs that most interest you always have time to grab coffee 24-7, no matter where you live. I have one quick favor to ask you. Remember to rate, review, and subscribe to Time for Coffee. Thanks so much. 